Well, God's grace, his mercy, his peace are yours through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray he opens our hearts and minds as we hear his word. That word is actually 11 chapters. We're not going to read them all today, but there are 11 chapters in Genesis, 25 through 35, the story of Jacob as we continue our sermon series, Godspeed on a Journey with Jesus. And as Pastor Gardner said, we're going to focus on a troubled past. You may be seated. So yes, this fall we're looking at real people in the past who encountered God in different circumstances. Last week we heard about Ruth and we learned about relationships. Two weeks ago, Abraham, and we learned about the, God, the calling of God. And today we'll talk about Abraham's grandson, Jacob, and look at that troubled past. We're gonna look at two different stories about Jacob. The first one is this very interesting thing that happened to him. Um, as he's traveling from his home to a place called Padan Aram in search of a wife. And this is from Genesis 28. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there at night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he he put it under his head and laid down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set forth on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, there was, oh, <laughs> and behold again, the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in you and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, This is the very gate of heaven. What an experience. What what an incredible blessing to see angels ascending and descending and then to behold God himself and to receive such an extraordinary blessing. You would certainly think that Jacob must be one notch below Jesus in his perfection and holiness and the way he conducts his life in order to be worthy of such a promise. In fact, God himself calls him himself by name as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as he identifies himself to Moses in the burning bush and in many other places in the Bible as well. So Jacob must be a fine, upstanding man. No, not so much. In fact, Jacob is what's known in the study of ancient Near East literature as a trickster. You can probably guess what that means. His name can even be connected to the ancient Hebrew verb meaning deceive. Let's look at Jacob's track record. He cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright and blessing in part by deceiving his blind father Isaac. He managed his father-in-law Laban's livestock in such a way that benefited him and at the same time did harm to Laban. When he was threatened by the arrival of his brother Esau, who was understandably upset about what happened, (laughs) Jacob divided his family in a way that protected his favorite wife and his favorite son from a possible attack. And when his daughter Dinah was dishonored, Jacob was more concerned for his own safety than for Dinah's honor. You know, Abraham and and Isaac are typically characterized as sinful and flawed, but still pious men. Jacob, well, he does everything (laughs) to manipulate and deceive and things that are self-serving. So how can it be that he is named in this covenant, God's ancient covenant of blessing for the children of Israel and this covenant for all of us as well? Well, there's a clue, and this is the second story I mentioned about Jacob, where he actually wrestles with God. And this is from chapter 32 of Genesis. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, 
and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. God gave Jacob a new name. He named him Israel. Martin Luther said this about Jacob's new name. Israel means a prince or God's fighter. That is, he who wrestles with God and wins. This happens through that faith which holds so firmly to God's word until it overcomes God's wrath and obtains God as gracious Father. Isn't that a beautiful picture of faith? Faith that holds on steadfast until God no longer has wrath, but instead beholds Jacob and all of us as our gracious Father. So Jacob is a trickster. He's a hustler. He's a manipulator. Yet that troubled past did not prevent God from using him to bless the nation of Israel and ultimately all people, us included. It didn't prevent God from giving Jacob, Israel, a saving faith in the promised Messiah. And it didn't stop God from saving humanity through Jacob's bloodline, through his son Judah, and ultimately through God's son our Savior, Jesus Christ. Troubled pasts and difficult circumstances, they are a big part of the bloodline of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jacob certainly is one of them. Rahab, the woman with a questionable past who was rescued from the city of Jericho. Ruth, who we just heard about last week, after she tragically lost her husband at a very young age, but later was given the joy of being King David's grandmother. God can, and always does, use sinful, fallen people to accomplish his perfect will. He takes people with troubled pasts and difficult circumstances and reveals his gospel, reveals his glory through them. People like Jacob, whose name went from deceiver to God's fighter. What a transformation. And with that change, understand this too, with that change in name came a new identity. So Jacob's value, his ultimate worth is not in who he was, it is in who God made him to be. So people like Jacob, but also people today, people like this man, Stephen McWhorter, with a troubled past. Stephen McWhorter, who hated Christianity. I can't emphasize to you enough, and you can look his story up, I can't emphasize to you enough how much he hated Christianity. Brought on because of his traveling evangelist father, whom he saw constantly abusing his mother. And so by the time Stephen reached age 17, he was a full-on crystal meth addict and wanted nothing to do with Christianity. He was angry, he was addicted, he was depressed. But God wanted him. And God sent the right people at the right time with the right message. The message is this, God exists and God loves you. And Stephen's faith reawakened and it grew and now he is an internationally known Christian singer and evangelist whose song, Come Jesus Come, is played constantly on Christian radio stations and over the internet. If you listen to Christian music on Caleb or locally, you've probably heard it 10 times already this morning. So people like Jacob and Stephen McWhorter and people like this woman, Catherine Wolf, who I was very blessed to hear speak recently. People in difficult circumstances like Catherine Wolf, who at the age of 26 and just six months after the birth of her first child, had a massive stroke caused by an extremely rare disorder and was in no way expected to live. But God wanted her, and God preserved her life. 
And now he uses Catherine and her husband Jay to share the truth that joy and hope in Christ can be found in all circumstances. So Catherine, crippled by the stroke that she had so many years ago, she has written two books. She speaks at numerous events throughout the country and with her husband also operates several ministries which give the hope of Christ to people who are living in difficult circumstances. So people like Jacob and Stephen and Catherine and people like you. What troubled past has shaped what you think about your identity? What sin, whether it's yours or someone else's, has shaped your perception of yourself? What names have you given yourself? You can know this, trust this, rest in this. Just like Jacob, God has given you a new name. He has given you this name, the name Jesus. And that name, if we look at the original Hebrew, means Jehovah is salvation. We can use the word God. We can use the word Yahweh. God is our salvation. And that's the name that God has given you. Not just that God gives salvation, but that he is salvation through the great love he's shown us through Jesus Christ. And with that name comes a new identity. That is a fact. And that's important to know because listen to these words from Tim Keller, a pastor and author. He said this about our identity. Our identity as fallen sinful people leads only to hell. And we can't avoid that trajectory away from God and toward hell unless something changes our identity. We cannot change our identity. Only God can. And he has. He has, through Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone, gone. The new has come. Your identity is not what you've done or what you haven't done. Your identity is not wrapped up in what has happened to you or what has not happened to you. No matter how troubled your past, your identity is tied and rooted and planted and fixed on the rock of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you on the cross of Calvary. That's who you are. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he describes our glorious connection to Christ in Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. United with Christ, connected to him in his death, and then walking in newness of life through his resurrection. That's your story. That is your identity. Who you were is not who you are. It is what God is making you to be. Your name, your identity is now these three simple words, the most glorious words we could ever hear. God is salvation. In the mighty name of our Savior Jesus, amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God is salvation unto life everlasting. Amen. Let's take a moment now together and confess our faith.